Okay, everybody out there ready? Here we go. One. Mm. Take two. There you go. Good morning, everybody. The name of that song is called Karaoke. And by the way, the definition of that, the word karaoke, is a native of Rio de Janeiro. And it was written in 1933 by Vincent Human and the lyrics by Edward Elisco and Gus Kahn. And it was in the movie in 1933 called Flying Down the Regal. Fred Astaire was in there, you know, he danced with Ginger Rogers. The, the whole thing, it, it must, I, I never saw it. I, as a matter of fact, I'm going to check with my library because sometimes they have these old movies. But that's the song, Karaoke, and I wanted to introduce you to it because it's a beautiful melody and I still play it quite a bit on the various gigs that I do. So now, I ask you, where do you go to listen to an interview and the host comes on and plays a song and educates you on some great standard of many years ago to give, you know, give a little bit of credit to the guys who wrote these. These were geniuses. They're, that song in 1933, that's going on 100 years old. It still sounds good. So where do you go to hear this? I'll tell you where. Life After Scientology, and I am your host, Ron Miscavige. So let me put my horn away, and we're going to get into the show. And I can tell you, uh, what we're, what we're going to take up Oh, before we get started, uh, and by the way, is somebody doing something on the other end where I hear noise? You got to cool it or wear felt shoes or felt gloves next time because it changes the picture from this end to you. Okay, so here we go. Um, first off, I want to do a little business and thank somebody who became a patron, and that's Kyle Carter for $5. Kyle, thank you very much. I very much appreciate that. And for those of you who don't know about this, which I don't think very many of you, you can become a patron by going, by going to my website, therealronmiscavige.com, and it will show you how to do it. Basically, it's a program where you can contribute something to the ongoingness of this show, because as you all know, we don't have a sponsor, so we depend on things like that to keep us rolling. Although, no matter what, I'm going to keep doing the show. Um, this I do out of duty. My music I do for pleasure. This is something, the, the further on I get into it and the more people I interview and the more things I find out, uh, we get a bad situation here with Scientology. I mean, it's not pretty bad. It's real bad. So what we're going to take up in this interview is the subject of what's it like to live in a cult. Now, we would talk about also why people don't speak up, and also the consequences of speaking up. But I want to bring up a couple, three people actually, three people whose names I'm going to give to you right now. Guillaume Leserve, who is the ED, executive director of Scientology International, of all of Scientology, okay? Ray Midoff, the most senior technical terminal in all of Scientology. And Mark Yeager used to be the commanding officer of CMO Int. These three people I want to take up because, well, actually, Karen is going to take this subject up mostly. It's her interview. These people have been abused. And we want to get into it today. And let me start off with Mark Yeager. And let me give you a little bit of data about him. Mark Yeager is a 45-year Sea Org veteran. 
He's been in it for 45 years, maybe even more at this point, but I know it's 45. He joined the Sea Org when he was nine years old and he was on the Apollo with L. Ron Hubbard. Now, listen to what I'm going to say. At one point, David Miscavige ordered Sadie Johansson to go after Mark Yeager, who was cut loose at the base in her Volkswagen Beetle and run him down. Now listen, I'm not making this up. This actually happened. She was ordered to go and do this, and she instantly complied. And Mark Ager ran for his very life, eluding her most of the time. And it got to the point where he was by the cine gym, which is the big building there that they shoot movies in. And to evade her, he jumped into a loading dock. I guess it must have been about an eight foot drop where the tractor trailer trucks back up. So when they back down this thing, the tractor trailer truck bed is even with the ground. So they unload stuff easily. Mark jumped into that and broke his foot and that ended the chase. You hear what I just said. Now, Mark Headley told me this because I wasn't, I didn't witness this personally, but he told me that at a, a muster, they called a muster and he complimented Sadie for instant compliance because when he told her to run over Mark Yeager, run him down, she said, yes, sir, and went ahead and did it. Now, Karen, Karen De La Curie is my guest, obviously, because you saw her back and forth on the screen. How did it get to this state of affairs? Because this is a horror story. This, you know, I had one uh, viewer write in and say, oh, yeah, there's many corporations that will clap like clapping seals in the corporate life. In, uh, and they, she named a couple of businesses and they all do this. They all are brown nosers and stuff. That may be true. You name another one that does things like this. Or if you leave, you have to give up your family and your friends. But let's talk about this with Mark Yeager. That incident, how did it get to be that way? Good morning, Karen, and over to you. Ron, you know, traditionally, typically, when you work for any entity, if you work for the Army, Air Force, Navy, if you work for a corporation, if you work for some big conglomerate, no matter who you work for, the longer you work, the more you get promoted, the more perks you get, the more things are better for you. Mike, you, you served in the Marines, so you know this. Okay, Karen, let me tell you something. In the Marines, as an enlisted man, uh, on your uniform, you would wear a slash. I think it was for every four years you were in. So if you saw somebody with two or three slashes on you paid him respect yeah that was the moral code it wasn't only from the superiors but it was from your fellow man who were in the same service as you you got respect and you you know let him go through the door first if it came to that or you you treated him properly you didn't abuse him you just didn't do it well let me tell you go, go on in scientology it's the reverse the longer you're in the more you work like a dog 80 hours a week, no annual leave, no day off, the more you serve, the more you get abused and the more privileges are taken away. So these three top, top execs, um, one day a notice was put outside the hierarchy office saying that these three people were suppressive to David Miscavige and they were SPs, antisocial personalities, and they were locked in a room which then became the famous SP hole. That was the nickname for it, right? Yeah. They were locked in there and they basically had to cough up crimes. They had to confess to the harm they did to destroy David Miscavige and to destroy Scientology. 
Now, these three people you mentioned had been in like 30 years, 35 years. <laughs> so at this point, they are treated like the criminals of planet Earth, which is what I was trying to tell you. Instead of getting more bonuses, more pay, more perks, because you served 20, 25 years, in Scientology, the longer you're in, the attitude is, come on, you know the score. You're, you're a veteran. Get, get your ass in here and bend over. And we are going to crush you. We are going. The intent is always to humiliate and degrade. Were you at, you were there when all of uh, this very high echelon in the church called CMO Int, they had to clean with a toothbrush for two weeks. The sea, it wasn't just do cleaning. They had to clean the kitchen, which is known as galley in nautical terms, for two weeks, many, many hours a day with a toothbrush. Yeah. What? Only in a cult. Can you just imagine the Episcopalian Church, the Methodist, Southern Baptist? Can you imagine them hauling in their ministers, their staff? Their priests, their whatever, no, and I, making I, I, and making them clean with a toothbrush. Yeah, Karen, dirty grime. I, I know you said it rhetorically. Could you imagine it? Absolutely not. And mm -hmm. I absolutely can never see that happening in like these churches you spoke about. It, it just the 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 intent is to degrade and humiliate. It has nothing to do with you becoming better. Uh, by doing something that you say, oh, gee, I wish I would have been better. Let me change my ways. No, it's to break you as a person. That's what it is. Anyway, continue. Well, Hubbard wrote an issue, and it's nicknamed Too Gruesome. And what he said in this policy was that, basically, there wasn't enough punishment in Scientology. The punishment needed to escalate and be so gruesome and so bad that it taught people a lesson to never ever screw up again. Now, let me tell you, don't you agree with this statement, Ron? In Scientology, there are no mistakes. There are no errors. There are only crimes. Yeah. There's no such thing that you committed it that you made a mistake, you willfully, from the evil in your heart, yeah. did that on purpose, deliberately. Uh, that's, uh, the, uh, that's the Scientology mindset. It, it is run on people. That You're exactly right, Karen. Like you, you might just be a little bit sleep deprived and maybe uh, going to work and you do something to think, oh God, why did I do that? No, that then would be, you'd be going under interrogation what evil purpose do you have that caused you to do that? Yes. And you might just have not had enough sleep the night before <laughs> and you didn't do something or you did something that was a little bit dumb. Yeah. You're for it. Yeah. You're exactly right. That's exactly how it's done. And as far as punishment is concerned, let me tell you something. When I was growing up, I had a friend. His name was Joe Sirisky. And he was a little bit wild and his father used to beat him and we could hear him screaming outside. You think it changed him? Yeah, he became a criminal. He went to prison. That's how it changed him. From being a kid who was just a little bit on the wild side into being a full-fledged criminal that committed crimes that ended him up in jail. Mm. So I've never seen brutal punishment make somebody better or come to his senses. I've seen it make people leave yeah. wherever they were or just go after the attacker if they grew enough courage or maybe whatever they had to do to, to even the score a bit, but I've, I've never seen it work. And as a matter of fact, listen, and I'm going to end off because I want you to be the main one here. L. Ron Hubbard said in a policy called Essay on Management early on that punishment never works. Punishment drive never works. It's the willingness of the person to do it all along that makes him do it. But the punishment drive, if anything, lessens the effectiveness and cuts down in his willingness.
Ron, 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 I've said this before. I'm going to say it again. For every goody two shoes spouted out in some policy letter, I can show you a complete 180 degree opposite statement by the founder. Well, like you just said it, two groups, that goes yeah. exactly into the two for punishment drive. In anything, you can throw out anything at me because I've been trained in the, the works. Yeah. All of OEC, all of FEBC, all of after class. The dichotomies and the complete opposite. <laughs> so which version do you want to believe today? No. Right. Karen, I'm, I'm not uh, opposing what you're saying. I'm just saying that if yeah. he wrote the two Hogwash. Groups, Hogwash. He said Hogwash. the exact opposite. Blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You, you've experienced the penalties. You've experienced the horror. Now, Ron, you lived at Ink Base for so long. Do you think you could just describe what I'm going to call the feces lake or the feces pond? I just want to give an example of too gruesome um, to the degree that the cult forced people till they got sick. Can you just describe what the feces lake is? Let's put it this way. It's an aeration pond where all of the garbage, the feces, the human waste, all kinds of things are laid in there. And I don't know the process that goes on over there, but apparently it's supposed to make it better for the environment. But it is literally. OK, I'm going to give you an example. If you were to go into the sewers in Paris, where all the sewage of the city falls into the sewer and it's washed down by water, that would be a clean lake compared to that pond at the international base. And staff had to go there and work there and just, I don't even know if they had rubber gloves. I know they didn't have any hazmat gear or anything on. I don't think... I, I think that may have contributed. No, the, the main thing is it was a punishment. Staff yeah. were just working there because staff were working there. No. A new punishment was evolved. Yep. That because you maliciously committed this problem or this error, you were going to be hurled into this pond with dead birds, bacteria, mm. feces, stinking and smelling your body was going to be thrown into this feces pond for punishment. Yeah. People were thrown in it. And then, as you say, people also had to, uh, another punishment was without hazmat suits, without any protection, bare hands had to be used to clean it out. Yeah. But these are what Hubbard said to do in his policy called too gruesome yeah well <laughs> it's even too gruesome to talk about it karen i gotta tell you yeah well uh mark yeager guillaume Serf, and ray midoff were probably kicked body slammed hurled to the ground maliciously punched in the head, punched in the ear, repeatedly and endlessly by your son, David Miscavige. Now David Miscavige, who couldn't resist punching every day, has removed himself from the property, which after, after doing this for years, I think he had to restrain himself by moving away from the property. You know, I think so I don't think the meetings. Yeah, go ahead. I know. I, I think you're right. I never thought of, I literally never thought about that. But that is a good point. So let's take Mark Yeager. Mark Yeager arrived at the Apollo at nine years old. And he was one of the very early messengers. I can't believe how he has lasted 50 years. Only a couple of years ago, he was testifying for the church while on the cell phone, every few minutes relaying to David Miscavige. Um, the, there was a very big lawsuit in Tel Aviv, Israel, where there was a runaway group who wanted to perform Scientology without the insanity of management. And Mark Yeager was there representing the cult and David Miscavige. 
This is a guy who has been crushed. Do you recall when he was, um, he, he tried to muck, he tried to stand up to Miscavige at one point. He tried to oppose some drastic things and he was banished to live in the wilderness. You know, you know about that front, of right? Do, for yeah. two years yep. with a garden hose, just a garden hose and a bucket for toilet. For yep. two years, he had to live. Did he live in a tent? I think he had a makeshift lean-to out there. But he had to build his own uh, shelter. Right. This is right in the swamp next to uh, the trailers that are on the one side of the base. Right. Near where was Old Gilman House, right? That that what, yeah. that end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. OGH it was called for sure. OGH, yeah. So he had to live outdoors in isolation where no one was allowed to speak to him. This is a guy who was Inspector General Edmund, who was watchdog committee. In fact, I don't think after David Miscavige, he was, I believe he was second. Would you agree he was second in command? Yeah, well, all the IGs, they were, uh, I wasn't a tree of Inspector the general. Admin, admin, IG admin, IG tech, IG ethics. Yeah. And yeah. I guess if you want to come right down to it, but I think Mark actually was the second in charge, now that I think about it. Yeah. yeah. Well, <laughs> Greg Wilhair, infamous Greg Wilhair, who was IG, do you know why he was busted as Inspector General? He was falsifying counseling records while auditing John Travolta. Wow. Here's, <laughs> here's a guy who is the absolute head of all of Scientology below him. And he sits in an auditing room and he makes up stuff that he writes in worksheets, falsifying what John Travolta said and what was done. And when it was found out, he was removed from being Inspector General. Now, this must have been before they had uh, a camera on the session or a tape recorder. Yes, I believe so. I believe so. John, John was getting audited by Greg a little a little ways back. That doesn't happen now. Right, and that auditing could have taken place at John's home, couldn't it have? Yes, they got room service. If you were, if you had star power, the auditor came to you, yeah, to your home and did it all very privately. You yeah, had your counseling in private. You know, there's a heartbreaking story about since we brought up. <laughs> I know we can jump around. We're, we're explaining the culture and we're explaining what is so wrong with this Taliban Scientology. It yeah. is the cruelty within is truly beyond belief. I can try and talk from my heart. I had six months of it up there. Good thing I'm strong. I can understand why people have mental breakdowns. I can yeah. understand that all too well. You know, people do have mental breakdowns and in while in session, while in the counseling session. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and in Scientology, they, they call it going type three. Type three, right. and they cover it up. Oh, they cover it up. They don't want the world to know that Scientology drove the person insane. Yeah. Nancy Maney wrote a book I highly recommend. You can get on Amazon called My Billion Year Contract. Right. And she was having a counseling session at um, the Hollywood building on church property. And the auditor, the counselor screamed at her and she explains her mind cracked. Anyway, she went into a full blown mental breakdown and she tells the story so beautifully in, in the book, My Billionaire. It's just, she just opens up what it's like to, and you know, the church wouldn't, the cult, church my ass, the cult would not touch her. Yeah. Her husband said, look, this happened on your property. This happened in the middle of a counseling session. 
they kept their just they didn't want to hear about it they didn't want to touch it so she went for psychiatry it, it the book is a is a wonderful mm. book highly recommended now i wanted to get back to darius just to give a little story of how parents can become well, in the country explain what relationship darius is to who we've been talking about though yeah okay greg will had this grandiose title, Inspector General. And he, almost equivalent to the Pope, or say Deputy Pope. Right. <laughs> the Deputy Ms. Pope. was always the Pope, yeah. Uh -huh. You're right, you're right. Yeah, yeah. So he had a son called Darius, who was born and bred in the seal. And Darius somehow fell into disgrace. He did something which made your son, David Miscavige, the leader of the cult, very upset. And at 18, 19 years old, he was thrown out, expelled, sent to a Greyhound station with like 300 bucks and told, get lost. He didn't know anything else. He was born in the cult. Right. He would be like one of these polygamy kids who don't even know an outside world exists. Well, Darius didn't know of the world other than the C organization. Right. So at this bus station, he writes a petition begging to come back to the cult. And he said he would do anything. And so they had a bright idea. They would send him to Mexico. Mexico was always used as a degrade. There was an issue that came out in 19, in 1983, 84, it said, if you get pregnant, we're gonna ship you to Mexico as a, <laughs> as a punishment. You will go to some dying, class four org in Mexico, Mexico, and Mexico was used like this third world country. If you can't make it in Scientology, and I say, we'll ship you to Mexico. Mexico was used as the degrade. Then it caused a bit of a flap and they quickly withdrew. <laughs> they realized we can't name Mexico with such a degradation things so we, we won't anyway back to darius they told darius all right all right we'll take you back but you have to go to mexico and you have to go to a failing org in guadalajara or some place where it's all falling apart and they, they don't have money for you the utilities are switched off and there's no payroll and you go there and if you can boom guadalajara and make it the best org in Mexico will forgive you for your transgressions. That's the message Darius got. So Darius rented a car, whatever, and he started driving to Mexico. He didn't speak one word of Spanish. Right. And then something went very wrong. Uh, I don't have all the data on the accident, but I do know that an 18 wheel tractor trailer was involved and Darius was in the car he was driving totaled and Darius died. He literally flatlined and he was completely unresponsive when the EMTs came. Th this happened in the United States. Not he hadn't yet arrived in Mexico. Right. And he was dead. Well, Ron, as luck would have it, five to six minutes later, Darius came back from the dead. He didn't die. He had broken something like 122 bones. And he was in hospital, I think for a year or something like that. Anyway, 
the cult that had sucked out all his work 60 80 hours a week throughout his teenage years didn't pay one thin dime for his medical nothing and his parents never went to see him greg wilhead this high inspector general and sandy his wife cut him off like a leper wow he was their only child and as he lay there with 122 broken bones there was nothing from them you know i ran into sandy wilhead uh, maybe in 1989 at in los angeles and i said hey sandy how's darius because i didn't know all of this and she looked at me and she said Darius is a declared suppressive person. I have no communication with him. And, and she almost I, she almost said it proudly, like, look, at, I'm a good Scientologist. I'm a good Scientologist. Yeah, unbelievable. So, yeah. Now, the reason I tell you this story is just to get the mindset. Yeah. When you go into Scientology, you're not thinking, well, my son can die in a car accident. Screw him. He can lie in us. I'm, I'm, I'm being a good, loyal Scientologist. Yeah. I can be trusted by David Miscavige. I'm not going to talk to that dirty, criminal, transgression boy that is my son. This is the mindset that the, that the cult slowly morphs your mind into. Yeah. It actually is a horrible state of affairs. You realize that. I mean, it just, it kind of done is done on a gradient, slow basis. And one day you're this way and somewhere down the line, you're the exactly opposite. And you don't you actually realize, you actually don't realize that you've turned into that person. Yeah. And that makes it stick. And you'll yeah. defend it. You'll defend your actions with justified thought and everything you do is justified of course i had to do that of course of course it's just a matter of fact you know meanwhile darius uh, that's well, darius, darius has I, I, no yeah. darius doesn't participate in scientology anymore he yeah. he's he's made it out he got married he has a couple of kids he's doesn't participate you know Oh, listen, Dar I, I, darius's I story wait, wait, is not darius, unique Aaron, uh -huh. i knew darius as a little kid and I remember one time at the Fort Harrison, he was just a little kid and they were living like on a fourth or fifth floor. He took his shoes and threw them out the window. <laughs> thank God it didn't hit anybody on the way down. Because even a kid's shoe coming down four or five story, you hit you in the head, you're going to have a headache. Yeah. Yeah. He just, he did things like that. He was uh, a little, Mischievous. A, a little whippersnapper. Yeah, but a lovable person. I, I got to tell you. And to just abandon him in a, a bed with over a hundred broken bones, that takes a real state of mind that, you know, you can say what you want. There may be other groups who will clap for the leader and stuff, but I don't know of other groups that do this. And if they do, well, listen to this program and say, hey, wait a minute, what the hell am I doing here? Anyway, you know, you want, you know Darius's here. story is not unique. I just want to show you that in the cult your mind is wedged and tampered with so much that you're totally willing to sacrifice the most precious relationship that you can have which is your own children they do this with children to parents parents to children this is a love only me cult your loyalty and love has to only be for Scientology. It's it's bizarre. They let me let me just give you another very short anecdote. When I came out very publicly nine years ago, I came out on a blog. I had five hundred email in one evening because I was very well known in the cult. I'd been there years. I did this and that. I, so one of the letters really touched me i i i gotta tell you this wrong you'll relate to it yeah, go ahead and it said you know 
my mom and dad, they're still at the base. And I was just wondering if there's any way you could just tell me if they're okay. And I said, who is your mom and dad? And he said, my dad is Bill Price and my mom is Sue Price. Sue Price has been that screaming, hysterical, menacing lunatic on free wins for the last several years, screaming at juniors. She's been an absolute terror, I believe her. Status is CO, CO, CO CMO ship, or she's in CMO. Yeah. And Bill Price has been in the RPF for years, years. There's this little anecdote where the, the cult had invested in gold and they had all these gold bars. They, they, they bought it. And Bill was in treasury finance and he was ordered to sell the gold, liquidate it, put the cash. And he didn't do it, didn't do it. And finally, David Miscavige got furious that the gold wasn't sold. And he was sent to the RPF, but the gold was sold at $300 an ounce. And two or three years later, it was $1,200 to $1,500 an ounce. I know. So, th so that's, anyway, Bill was in the RPF. So this, this kid tells me, he said, Karen, I really want to know, I'll tell you why. I'm, I'm, I'm successful now. I made it out. I'm in computers and I have a child and I just want my parents to know that they are a grandparent. Wow. And that really touched me. You know, it touched me. Here's a boy who was slung out again. He was kicked out, expelled from the cult and he has a child and he was wanting to know that his parents were okay. And he wanted them to know he had a child. Never, never going to happen. No. When you join the cult of Scientology and they unleash on you and kick you out and expel you, you are cast to the wilderness. Yeah. Hey, listen, I was not kicked out. I escaped. Lori and Denise, all my grandchildren from them. And great grandchildren, they're gone. Yeah, yeah. You've got grand, great grandchildren you've never even met. No, I, right? I don't even know how many, and I've never seen a picture of them. Thank God, I still have Jenna and Dallas and yeah, Wayne and Archie. Yeah, yes, you have Jenna, and Bonnie, my son, and uh, but yes. the rest are gone, and it's like ho oh, hum. That's what we do. Yeah, you, you do that, and that's people who say, oh, well, other groups do it. No, they don't do things like this. They, mm -hmm. they do have adulation and professional brown nosers and butt kissers in them. And that'll do anything the leader says. But you leave and uh, you might not, they might not be friendly with you, but you don't lose your family or your friends. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're not cast aside. And you get severance pay too when you leave. Yeah. What, what severance pay do you get there? Darius given a couple $300 to go and Boom, <laughs> failing or on his own, he doesn't speak the fucking language. Please, what is it meant to do? Degrade you and punish you and make you into a nothing, which you are not. You are something, and you can achieve anything you you decide to in your own mind. But they break you down so much, so much that the only thing you think you can do is fail. That's the product of uh, many years. Instead of getting more and more uh, support from the group and a little bit more admiration and perks it's just the opposite staying long enough you will be turned into a broken piece but but you see this is what is so baffling the cult of scientology crave religious mm. recognition they want in the law courts they scream your honor we're a religion but we've said this before where is the humanity where's the kindness the love the the knowledge, the knowingness to give you, to get you to be a better human being, to this, to be more understanding, to have more wisdom. There is nothing religious about Scientology. No. It's a corporate entity, a spy organization, and a deadly gang of pokes, 
organize to get maximum production out of you, to suck out <laughs> for minimum pay, to crack a whip and make you a slave. So all those glossy magazines and the fluff and froth on Scientology TV is bullshit. Absolute nonsense. Well, one thing you just said, which, Ron, one thing you just said, which is very, very, uh, which is a complete lie, very duplicitous, is they keep saying that people like you and me were expelled. They say that Mike Rinder was expelled. We fled. Yeah. Every single person that departed, they, the cult claims, oh, they were, of course they expelled us after we came out speaking. But yeah. they make it out like these people, they, they even say that about Leah Remini. They say, oh, we had to expel her. Her, her ethics wasn't up to our level of ethics. Shh. You know, um, uh, they begged Leah to stay. I know. Here's a comparable date. I mean, it, it's in a Woody Allen movie where he says, and of course, I love Woody Allen movies. He says, oh, yeah, they're, they're talking about relationships. And he said, yeah. Uh, my girlfriend left me for another man, so I decided to break off. <laughs> That's like us, you know. We leave, so oh wait a minute, hold it. Well, wait, no, no, we expelled them. They didn't leave, you know. Yeah, yeah. So we talked early as you started the show, Ron. We talked about punitive actions and increasing penalties. And the longer you stayed. Instead of rewarding you more, you got a whip cracked at you the longer you stayed. Yep. And this then developed into what is called the dungeon in slang or SP hole. By the way, um, I sent a copy of Mark, Mark Headley's book, Blown for Good, to every single police officer in Hammond. Wow. And I got feedback. They are very aware of SP Hole, those police officers. Nope. They know. <laughs> wow, that is yeah. well done, Karen. God well, damn. <laughs> they Well, it's right on their zip code. It's down the road from them. They should know what goes on at InBase. Well, the reason I said that is... Um, a, a couple of police officers from Hemet came to see me because they had received my former husband, who was the president of the church, was missing, and they had filed missing person mis uh, missing person reports. So these two Hemet officers came to see me, and they told me a darling little anecdote. You know the escape mark. Headley did on his motorbike where they tried to chase him down. Oh, yeah. Right. Mark Headley, again, a second generation born in it all. He had it. He, he had it up to there. He had been punched, beaten, sleep deprivation. He left. And he left on a, on a bike. And it started pouring with rain. And the cult did a chase. The cult is very organized to pursue you if you flee in terror that you're going to go to the media and do shows like we're doing. This is what they're, this is, this is what they're really scared of. We're going to talk. We're going to tell the world what goes on behind all the fluff and froth of their glossy magazines, which are a tissue of lies. <laughs> <laughs> and, and Karen, you know, the car that they use is actually called the chase car. <laughs> the I mean, it car. is actually called that. Uh, now, I don't know if that's just slang or it's uh, in, in print that it's that way. But, yeah, the guards, because when I left, I was going by Massacre Canyon Inn, which is where we ate our food. Yeah. And uh, MCI. <laughs> MCI, that's what they call it. And in there, Sal, Sal Mayo, uh, security guard, was eating. And I said his the chase car was outside. He was the driver of the chase car that day. Mm, mm, mm. Anyway, I just uh, mm. so 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 they 
they how they they knock over his motorbike and he falls in a gully he falls in a ravine the whole bike slides over and his little belongings and but by happenstance a driver on highway 79 witnesses an suv doing this to a motorcyclist and calls riverside sheriff so they show up pretty soon they must have had roving cars and they asked mark headley what happened now the reason i'm telling you this is do you remember i told you that hemet that uh hemet sheriffs came to see me on the missing heber yeah right mm -hmm. well the senior detective told me a wonderful little tale he said there was a lady sheriff and she read the report because mark headley at the time was trying to protect it he said no it was slippery and <clears throat> and and i i kind of slid and skid but right. the officer with penetrating eyes knew something wasn't adding up and mark looked like he was lying yeah and then muriel Dufresne shows up immediately she puts her foot in it so she shows up at another they sense there's a chase here and they give mark an escort to riverside two police cars yeah so this hemet sheriff tells me this older lady sheriff said you know what let's file this report very carefully because this is an int base story and there may be use of this to corroborate other data going forward in time mm -hmm. she knew the significance of staff hounding down and chasing like prey an escaping sea old member she got it well, anyway that's, that's this, very perceptive of her that was yeah, very very perceptive she died she she was an oldish and she has since he told me she really made a song and dance about it in in the hemet sheriff sheriff's office they really discussed this and she has sent he told me well after she did that a year later she passed mm. so i mean they came to see me years after this this chasing incident happened but ron you know about this i want you to chime in isn't it like a I know Gary Moorhead had a lot to do with it, but isn't it very, very organized to go oh. chase? <laughs> tell me about posses too. When there's blow drill, blow drill, that's what it's called. Yeah. And, uh, tell a it, little about it. it. It's like a military operation. I mean, you have like command headquarters, which is the security guards. You get a cell phone. And in those days they had Nextel which you could just press a button and it would turn into a walkie talkie. I mean, literally you could talk to somebody in Europe on the walkie talkie on that next L. There was only one fault with it. And I'll tell you what it was. If the other person that you were calling was loquacious or a, <laughs> like a talker who can't control his talk, <laughs> you couldn't get in and to, to say anything. You might say, what time is it? And he'd press the button. Well, right now, I don't know exactly what time it is, but I mean, I know it's going to be a nice day and it's cloudy out and would go on for 10 minutes. Oh, it's 10 after five. You were stuck. You couldn't get in at Ward Edgewise. Mm. You were issued these next tells. Uh, certain people were assigned to go to motels to see if they went there. Other people were assigned to go to railroad stations or bus stations. Uh, other people were assigned to go to maybe places where the guy may have gone on liberty or to his relatives places. In other words, everybody had an assigned duty and they would report in. And then um, you had a person there who had access to checking credit cards if they were used, not, not to hack the credit card. So if the guy used the credit card and they had his credit card numbers, they would say, okay, well, he used the credit card here to go to a motel, go check that out. This thing was orchestrated just like a military operation. And that's on one person. There may be involved in that 
maybe 20 people going out, maybe 25 people. All depends on uh, the rating they would give. Like a, some guys were mo more of a high security risk. Like I, I'm sure when I left, was considered mm -hmm. a high security risk because I was the, the father of the chairman of the board. And, of course, all I wanted to do was go out, get the hell out of where I was, what was happening in my life and start a new life and enjoy my life. That's all I intended to do. And, of course, they arranged it to take my family away. And I said, okay, fuck you. Now here I am. I'm doing a, a talk show every week. I wrote a book. Here it is. And by the way, if you've never read it, you should. Not yeah. because I wrote it, but it's yeah. a chronological story of when I was born, when David was born, right up to when I left. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what they turned me into. So it works. Their their policies work. Yeah. So you turned me into somebody who wants to expose you. I'm not your enemy. As a matter of fact, if anything, you, I could be your greatest friend, because if you come out of this personality you have as a rotten to the core cult, you might see the light of day and say, you know what? I don't want to do this anymore. Let's, if we're going to do this, let's sell courses where people can actually gain some ability, charge a reasonable amount on it. And let's not make families disconnect from each other or from friends. Let's do away with that. And let's give a general amnesty and say, everybody's forgiven of everything and let's start from fresh. So you turned me into one of your best friends. How do you like that? Ron, I have an absolute duplicative mirror story to yours. <laughs> when I first came out, I was never going to use my name. I used a pen name called War and Peace. <laughs> and I needed to vent. You know, yeah. I, had a, I had torture. I was made to run around a pool 12 hours a day. This was torture to me. At the ink base, when you gave me a hug, we were just outside Del Sol in that grassy knoll. You won't remember that, but. Oh, know, yes, I do. Uh, yes, I do. And I'll tell you why. I never, and I'll, I'll give myself credit for this. There's not many things I brag about. This is one of them. Whenever I see a person who's down and out, I don't do what many people do, and that's kick them when they're down. I try to give them encouragement because I'm telling you, when you're in, as they say, in the shit, that's what they call it. That little bit of encouragement really helps a person to help to help themselves pull themselves out of it. So I do remember that, Karen, and you were always a dear friend. Let me say that. And, uh, I, I just, <laughs> oh, Ron, I we, we go we're, back to the 1970s. We're, I know. We're, I know. we're old. And uh, anyway, um, I needed to vent. So I posted under this pen name, War and Peace. Do you know that the cult absolutely they must they put linda linda hamill intelligence top gun she's been the commanding officer of osa and don't know if she's still there and they outed me oh karen de la carrier is war and peace well guess what guess what it just increased my range and communication because my name was known. Now listen to this. Within three weeks of coming out from it, I got some frantic messages that the FBI had been told that I was trafficking in children for underage sex. Oh boy. This is typically the cult. Bring in sex and bring in a blood curdling. So I went from being their highest trained class 12 case supervisor. And the next morning I woke up and I was a trafficker in child, child sex. Just because I had come out and spoken on Marty's blog. So my CPA sent me these, said the FBI is here and a child protective, you know, some other one that specialized in child. And they said, Karen, they're asking me these questions. Did, did I ever send, did you procure this and this? Anyway, <laughs> I happily wanted to see them, to let them know it was the cult of Scientology. Right. But they they didn't even come to see me. The case was, it was an anonymous phone call. They didn't know it was a cult. They asked my CPA, 
Does Karen have any enemies? Do you have any? Oh, does Karen have any enemies? They said, he said, oh, she came up, she left the Church of Scientology two, three weeks ago and was active on the internet. Their, their whole body language shifted. As soon as the FBI and this other investigator heard that I had left the cult two, three weeks ago, and that they had this malicious <laughs> file closed. That was the end of it. Wow. Right? So, but listen, that's not the end of it. They then, to try and shut me into being frightened and run away, they called up, you know how I love animals. Yeah, I'm just, just, it's my, it's my joy. It's my, it's my therapy. It's my love. It's my passion. They called up animal control and told animal control that I was torturing my animals. Torturing them. They filed a report that I was torturing animals. So I had an animal control officer with his uniform and back. he came to inspect and he saw my animals were pampered and loved. And cages of birds were spotlessly clean. <clears throat> so I told him about the cult of Scientology. But then I got mad. And we went down to animal control office and we educated all the officers on the maliciousness of the cult. Then the very next day, I know we're running out of time, but I got to tell you this. Go on. They sent health control officer to say that I lived in such a dire, unhealthy thing that there were rats running around and it was just the whole city was going to get plague. They always do it over the top, over the moon. No, nobody yeah. files complaint. So I had the health officer. Now, Ron, let me tell you, they crossed the line. Once they dreamt up that I was a trafficker of children of underage sex, and they dreamt up that I tortured animals, and they dreamt, they crossed the line. Yeah. And they made me. They absolutely goaded me. They crossed the line. And I, till I die, I will do 1,000 more every day. More, I will get more hits, I will get more views than they get of their hate pages. Like I'm competing. How many see their hate page? As long as those hate pages are up for me, they got me in a games condition. And I will tell, 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 tell. Lots more stories. I hope you have me back. Okay. Karen, I'll tell you something. <laughs> I'm not glad that they did it, but I'll tell you this. I'm <laughs> glad that it had that effect on you instead of crawling into a shell, because I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, I knew this we, was going to happen because we, we, we've we got to continue on with this. I don't even have to ask if you're coming back. I'm going to give you an order. I'm going to give you an order. You're coming back. On the show. I'm in the Marine. Well, we, we didn't even touch. We were originally going to talk, but it was all spontaneous. We were going to talk about Jaeger. We, now we've got that booked for us. You know, we've got to do that. Jaeger, Lesev, and Mark Jaeger, Guillaume yes. Lesev, and Ray Midoff, and, we, we and will, Hema Jench, my ex husband. We, we will get into it, but my producer is trying to get my attention. Okay. Here. Yep. Okay. We have a couple of super chats. Um, so Teresa Atkins for ten dollars says, "My first time I'm able to help out. Wonderful work, Ron." So oh, thanks, Teresa. Oh, thank you very much, Teresa. That's very nice of you. And then Forever Conscious Research Channel donated a dollar. So thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And this just let me go into a little talk on being a patron because uh, this definitely helps us. And if you'd like to contribute to the ongoingness of this show. Please become a Patreon. Go on to my site, uh, therealronmiscavige.com. It will show you how to do it. And we'll I'll continue to come on along with people, like wonderful people like Karen, to expose this cult and enlighten you and educate you so that you don't get trapped into something like this. There, there's other ones out there. So if you're getting the gist of this, you're get, this is going to foolproof you. So you run across this and say, hey, wait a minute. I know, what th I know where this is heading. See you later, alligator. So meanwhile, thank you very much, Karen. We'll announce when you're going to be on next, and uh, we're going to continue this dialogue. So for all thank of you. Thank you, Ron. Thank you, Ron. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Okay. And uh, for 
Life After Scientology, name of the show. I'm Ron Miscavige. I'll see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now.